Along with Erica Badu, Jill Scott, Lauren Hill, and D'Angelo, Maxwell is one of the artists who paved the way for neo-soul music. Since the release of his 1996 debut album, Maxwell's Urban Hang Suite, he has been nominated for 13 Grammys and has toured all over the world. Unlike some artists who release back-to-back -back albums year after year, Maxwell has taken a different approach. The Brooklyn native's painstaking music process means we sometimes have to wait close to a decade for his soulful romantic tunes. But there's actually a method to his creative process that includes crippling anxiety and a desire to achieve perfection, even if it means he writes and rewrites a song over the course of a few years. Let's take a closer look inside Maxwell's life and the real reason he takes his time when releasing new albums. Gerald Maxwell Rivera was born in Brooklyn on May 23rd to a Haitian mother and a Puerto Rican father. He told Pitchfork his mom was 16 when she gave birth to him and his dad was much older. Their strict religious parents didn't approve of the cross-cultural relationship. His father reportedly passed away in a plane crash when Maxwell was just three years old. Since he was the only child, his mother became very protective over him and never allowed him to leave their apartment except when it was necessary. In his imagination, Maxwell pictured himself outside playing basketball and baseball with the other kids. And he told the Los Angeles Times to keep himself busy inside his room, he created his own universe, complete with a television and a vast collection of books. He was a shy and quiet kid, but music gave him the confidence he needed to come out of his shell. At the age of 17, his friend lent him a cheap Casio keyboard. The first time he sat down with it, he looked up and realized eight hours had passed by and he was still sitting at the keyboard wearing his school jacket and backpack. At that moment, he realized he had discovered his future. He told the LA Times, music gave me this voice and a bridge to human people because when I was younger, I didn't really feel human. He estimates he wrote close to 300 songs during his early days. He recorded the songs on cassette tapes and gave them to his friends. His first public performance occurred at a restaurant called Nell's, and by that time, he had already made a name for himself on the New York music scene. With all the buzz about his talent, he was described as the next Prince by Vibe magazine, long before he was signed with Columbia Records in 1994. His debut album, Maxwell's Urban Hang Suite, was released in 1996 and paid homage to the soulful and warm vocals of musical legends like Marvin Gaye and Stevie Wonder. With some help from a tight-knit group of writers, including his friend Hod David, whom he met when they were both busboys at a New York restaurant, the album took listeners on the journey of Maxwell's failed romantic relationship and a fictional marriage proposal. Despite being critically acclaimed, the album had a sluggish start, with 63,000 copies sold in the first three months. Maxwell wasn't discouraged, though. He told the LA Times that before he even wrote the album's first song, he told himself, if this record doesn't fly, that's cool because it's my story that I'm expressing and it will always be right for me. Soon enough, the album reached a peak that most artists can only dream of. Fueled in part by the single Ascension, Don't Ever Wonder, and other hits including Something Something and Whenever, Wherever, Whatever, he snagged his first Grammy nomination for Best R&B Album. And the album was eventually certified two times platinum years after it was released. He recorded an MTV Unplugged session, which was released in 1997 as a seven-song EP, and the world was officially under his spell. But who was Maxwell? Everyone knew he was an amazing songwriter, performer, and artist, but he was also very mysterious. At the time his debut album was released, he kept his real name a secret. Music lovers also noticed the pseudonym M-U-S-Z-E was credited for writing and co-producing the album. When the LA Times asked him to explain the mysterious name, Maxwell reportedly pointed upward, flashed a smile, and winked. He was a brilliant enigma. Aside from the bits and pieces from his real-life experiences that he included in his lyrics, no one really knew who he was, and that's what Maxwell preferred. After the release of his first album, he took a trip to Africa. Although he didn't specify which country he visited, he said the music, beats, and horns he encountered during his vacation inspired him. During his visit, he said that his second album came to him and said, Make me. He jetted back to the USA to get to work, and in 1998, the platinum album Embrya was released. 
In 2001, he followed up with the album Now. Thanks to the tracks This Woman's Work, Get to Know Ya, and Lifetime, Now became his third platinum-selling album in a row. From 2001 through 2002, he hit the road for the Now Tour. While he should have been enjoying the overwhelming wave of success, he told CNN he got sick of himself. He was tired of being in the spotlight. He didn't want to see another picture of himself and he didn't even want to listen to his own music. He said, I just sort of needed a coffee bean in the perfume shop of who I was. You know what I mean? He announced his hiatus, ensuring his fans that he would only be taking a short break. But that short break turned into many years. So what was he doing? He told Reuters he was still making music, but he was also living a, quote, pedestrian life. He soon realized he liked being regular. Retreating from the spotlight also allowed him to gain some more real-life experiences, incidents that would then fuel his creativity and inspire his music. He experienced heartbreak, and in 2002, he poured his soul into the lyrics of a song that would become a musical masterpiece. But he wasn't ready to share the personal account of his failed relationship with the world just yet. He told Vanity Fair he listened to the song over and over again for years. He equated the song to having a child. He said, when people have kids, sometimes they take photos, but they don't necessarily put them out there. They want to cherish their child before the world can. Almost eight years after the release of his third album, Maxwell was ready to share his most cherished song with us. In April 2009, Pretty Wings was released, and it spent four weeks at the number one spot on the Billboard Hot R&B Hip Hop chart. He told Reuters the track was a bittersweet love song about meeting the right girl at the wrong time. It connected so well with his fan base, they couldn't wait for the album to drop. Black Summer's Night was released in July 2009, and it sold 316,000 copies in its first week. Maxwell won a Grammy for Best Male R&B Vocal Performance for Pretty Wings, and he also took home the Grammy for Best R&B Album. He was back. Or so we thought. He told Reuters he still planned to live life on his own terms and be as ordinary as possible. He said, I just want to have a house on the hill, some kids, and a wife I will never divorce. He promised fans that Black Summer's Night would be a trilogy of albums and he had already written and recorded most of the music for the second installment. His fans breathed a sigh of relief. They just knew they wouldn't have to wait long for more heart-pounding melodies and true-to-life love stories. But sadly, life got in the way, and fans waited, and waited, and waited. Four years after Black Summer's Night was released, Maxwell celebrated his 40th birthday, and his life got flipped upside down. He told Pitchfork he was riddled with anxiety as he witnessed all of his friends settle down and have children. Even his longtime collaborator, Hod David, had a child, and Maxwell couldn't help but feel like an afterthought in Hod's personal life. It took him some time to come to terms with the direction his own life had taken. At one point, he thought that a wife and children were in his future, but he began to pose the questions, why should I get married, just because it's supposed to happen at a certain age, and then I get divorced? He discovered that his own upbringing hindered his romantic relationships, and he was finding it difficult to meet someone who was, quote, all right with being in the background a little bit. Because at the end of the day, music is his true love. When he wasn't pondering his life and the choices he had made leading up to his 40th birthday, he told the New York Times he filled his days with a lot of Netflix, listening to music, traveling, and spending some time on the beach. He also entered a romantic relationship and said experiencing intimacy was, quote, awesome too when you throw it in here and there. He continued on, making memories and finding inspiration from his regular, ordinary life. He told Essence it was true that he had the material for the follow-up of Black Summer's Night ready to go, but he felt like he hadn't lived enough to bring out the right emotion that the album needed. He said he needed to get his heart broken, enjoy happiness, and get into certain situations in order to make the right kind of music that would touch people. He also referenced the Marvin Gaye biography, Divided Soul, and the one line that really stuck with him. It read, you can rush to fail, or you can take your time to succeed. And then his grandma and his cousin passed away. Maxwell processed that grief and was ready to give his fans what they wanted. 
He wasn't sure how he would be received by the music industry after yet another long hiatus, but he told Essence there was no malicious intent in staying away. It all boiled down to him being a perfectionist and living away from the spotlight was the only way he knew how to save the music and save himself. Seven years after Black Summer's Night, he released the second installment in 2016. It charted at number three on the Billboard 200 and included the song Lake by the Ocean, which won Best R&B Song at the 59th Annual Grammy Awards. He told the Chicago Tribune he hoped to have part three of the trilogy ready by 2017, but he wasn't making any promises. He said, I don't put my music before life because life feeds the music. He told the Chicago Tribune he ponders over his music over and over again due to his own insecurities. He never wants to create something that sounds like other music that's already on the radio. And when in doubt, he simply asks himself, would Marvin Gaye do this? He's also a creature of habit. He's one of the few mainstream artists who has remained on the same record label for the duration of their career. He doesn't even bring in new producers to experiment with new sounds. He prefers to work with his longtime collaborator, friend, and guitarist, Todd David, instead. This has ruffled some feathers in the industry. Maxwell told the New York Times that other neo-soul artists choose to work with black producers and black managers. So whenever Maxwell shows up with Hot David and John D. Hammond, both of whom are white, it turned a few heads. But the magic they've created over the past decades is a formula Maxwell isn't willing to mess with. In October 2018, Maxwell released the single Shame, which he said was a preview of his upcoming album entitled Night, the final installment of his album trilogy. He still graces the stage with his presence, including a September 2019 performance at Chastain Park in Atlanta, where he instituted a no cell phone policy so concert goers could have a blissful, distraction free evening. He's still having trouble finding the missing piece to his puzzle. He told the New York Times that finding a partner is difficult because he's, quote, a little screwed up. Music is so overwhelming to him that at this point, it beats any romantic relationship. It will wake him up in the morning and say, write this. And he has no choice but to obey. He achieves his greatest heightened sense of creativity when he feels like he's observing the song when it's happening as opposed to making it. He told the Chicago Tribune when he writes a really good song, he knows he didn't really write it. He said, you try to catch up with the thoughts like you're chipping away at a stone, and then someone pulls you away and says, look, it's done.